Part of overcoming the stigma around mental health is talking more openly, and that's what we want to do today with people who work with young people in our communities. I'm joined by Michelle Hurling, Executive Director of the Compassionate Touch Network, Dr. George Davis, a retired specialist in child and adolescent psychiatry, Micah Padilla, a peer educator with the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council in Albuquerque, and Dr. Andrew Shi, Director of the Institute for Resilience, Health, and Justice at the University of New Mexico Health Science Center. Michelle, your organization teaches a curriculum in schools called Breaking the Silence. Your own brother struggled with mental illness in his preteen years. How do you want to change the conversation about mental health in local schools? I want to begin to have one because as a family, um, back in the late 50s, early 60s, we had no idea what was going on. When you mentioned the term mental illness, people just automatically thought of institutionalization. And um, that is not something that my family was willing to talk about and my brother really didn't need. So um, I tell students when I go in to do these lessons that I want to uh, I don't want them to have to go through what my family went through because we were on eggshells all the time. We never knew when my brother was going to blow up. He wasn't on medication. None of this was his fault. None of it was really my family's fault. It was just a lack of education, which is why I connected with Breaking the Silence New Mexico. I thought, let's get teens educated and then they can possibly educate their parents or go home and let them know what they've learned. How have things changed since the time when your brother was growing up? Oh, there's so many more therapies. Um, there, there's many more medications, and there's many more types of talk therapy, and many more different types of uh, or greater understanding about um, how that exercise can help, nutrition can help. So our understanding is growing, but it still isn't enough. Micah, you just graduated from high school. Yes, Congratulations. I did. What do you think keeps students from talking about mental health issues? Um, Even though we hear that our things have gotten a lot better yeah. when her brother was in school. But. Um, I think the, the one thing that stops uh, students from really talking about it is like the stigma that surrounds it. Suppose most students think that it's a bad thing that um, that you have a mental illness, when in reality it's not. It's something that you can't prevent, and it's something that um, can be um, can be helped or like dealt with. And um, I, th I feel like students just um, for the the fact that uh, that there's not a lot of conversation about it, and that there's stigma surrounding it. Um, it's a lot. It's just a, a little bit harder for students to really be open to talk about it. Why, why is this so important to you? Why do you want to get involved in it? It's really important to me because, one, I saw a need in my community as well because before we partnered up with Breaking the Silence New Mexico, um, I didn't know much about mental health or mental illnesses. And once I started um, getting educated myself about mental health and mental illnesses and suicide, um, I found out that the majority, my family doesn't know a lot about it. Um, my friends' families don't either. So I felt like it was something very important that I needed to pursue, but also um, the major the advisory council needed to pursue as well. So you help bring the breaking the silence into schools as a peer educator. Mm -hmm. Why is it so much more effective for students like you to talk to other students? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's a lot easier to, to talk Two students that are, are um, two people closer to your age, you feel more comfortable. Um, in the classroom, you could see that they're more interactive. Um, for example, when um, when they uh, when like the coordinators were presenting to us, we weren't as interactive, and you can see that in students. But then once um, us as peer educators came into the classroom, uh, they were a lot more interactive and they were more willing to participate. And um, what signs did you see that some of your friends or peers might have been going through issues around mental health? Um, How does it show up if people are, you know, they want to help their friends? Like, what, what should people look for? Um, they should definitely look for, for like any. Um, 
any like drastic changes in their mood. For example, if they're they're happy in one moment and then all of a sudden really sad in the other, or they're not very open to talking about anything. Um, for example, if they used to be very um, open and very interactive with other students and now they're all of a sudden not and it's been like, and it's starting to be a problem for them, then I feel like that's something really to look for, like patterns. And Michelle, I mean, people could write that off saying, ah, oh, it's teenagers, they're moody. Absolutely, and the program actually addresses that. We do talk about, all of us get anxiety, teenagers, adults, and, and what takes it beyond the level of just ordinary, everyday anxiety or periodic anxiety. So you're absolutely right. I want to turn to you, Dr. Davis. Before you retired from the Children, Youth, and Families Department, you did a study on young people in the state's juvenile justice system. And you found that a majority of them had experienced traumatic events growing up, like abuse, neglect, witnessing violence, much more than kids in the general population. So I've heard people who work with trauma and kids talk about reframing questions. Maybe this is helpful for schools as well when kids are running into trouble saying, what's wrong with you? And instead ask, what happened to you? We seem to know that trauma has serious impacts on kids and young people, but do our healthcare and educational institutions reflect that knowledge? You know, they do and they don't. Um, it's, uh, I think the, the knowledge about trauma is this gathering kind of um, agenda for mental health, but, but it's very slow in coming. Uh, for, for example, we, we knew how important trauma was for the last 15, 20 years. It's the, the neurobiology of it, the developmental kinds of impact of it um, have been clear. Uh, and when you look at something like the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, you recognize that over, you know, over time it has that health consequences and mental health consequences. It increases suicide 12 times. Trauma does that kind of thing. But I think knowing what to do about it has been a lot slower in coming. And um, therefore, it is, uh, it's, not, it's not as easily standardized. Uh, for example, um, trauma doesn't respond really well to medicines. It doesn't respond to typical um, counseling uh, or interventions like that. It's a, it's a different kind of, uh, of effect. And even though it looks like mental illness, and it is a kind of mental illness, um, the, the treatments for it are different, more difficult, and probably more labor intensive. Is trauma more widespread than we understand in terms of what we're talking about with young people? I would say, I, yes. I mean, I think that's the biggest lesson we've learned from the public health studies, like the adverse experience study again, and even the one in juvenile justice. Um, um, you could look at even the, a population that would fit those of us here at the table. 28% um, of them had experienced physical abuse. 21% uh, had experienced uh, sexual abuse. Uh, and then the other adverse experiences were things like emotional neglect and abuse, physical neglect and abuse, substance abuse in the family. And those were enormously pervasive. And then if you look at juvenile justice population, um, the, the number of adolescents who are in the facility are actually incarcerated, um, more than 93 percent of them have experienced uh, a severe amount of trauma. And so it, it comes to the point where it's what's making juvenile justice happen, uh, mm. that early kind of trauma. Do you feel like if there was a wider discussion of this as they're trying to do in schools, then this might short circuit that cycle? I definitely do. I, th I think you couldn't, uh, it's among the most important things too is to, is to open up the, uh, the discussion of mental illness, but, it, but also to open up the discussion about trauma uh, and its effects and what happens in our lives. Um, Andy, uh, Dr. Shi, young people don't grow up in a bubble. They're in a family or an ecosystem, some family caregiving situation. So how do these cycles play out if we don't reach young people who might need mental health services? Well, it's, I think the critical issue facing how healthcare is organized right now, uh, Megan and 
uh, the work done to educate young people in schools and school staff about uh, mental illness and depression ties back to what potential impact can we have when we reach their families. In the groups of families we take care of who've had uh, significant amounts of trauma and substance use disorder and mental illness in parallel, um, what we see as the greatest risk is that these behaviors can be transmitted to the children and we might see them in the pediatric clinic in, in forms of things like ADHD or, or depression, but uh, we are not very well equipped to treat the parents simultaneously as we address the needs of the kids. I think ultimately to be effective in primary care and behavioral health, we're going to have to generate uh, two generation models of organized care to alleviate suffering. Even a young person who has a significant mental illness in a family that is you know, well equipped and has a lot of resources to address it, tremendous suffering experienced by the parents and very little help in terms of alleviating those feelings um, to the point that they begin experiencing toxic stress. And, and behavioral health care and health care systems are generally unaware of how that impacts the rest of the family. So if this isn't addressed, then these kids learn that that's the way to parent? They, they learn the how to, cycle continues, to hide it. They, they feel ashamed about it. And then, and then they have children. And then they begin to manifest those uh, behaviors in a way that creates uh, a toxic stress to the children. So, so many families have this history of depression. And um, it's so important, I think, to start very early, three, four years old, talking about what it's like to be sad. And mm -hmm. when you're sad, what do you do about it? And that adults, people around the child, will have periods of sadness. It doesn't mean that there's not affection for the child, but they may become withdrawn. And it's not the child's fault. Okay. And, you know? Is it difficult? We're talking about three and four year olds. When you started doing this, what was the reaction of you know, parents or people like you want to talk about mental health with my kids? I mean, is that, that, that's a little dangerous ground, right? Like they're just kids. They don't need to hear about these issues. We have found that actually <clears throat> we've been called in by parents. Parents have called us and said, you're not in my school. Um, you're and not you in there. my kid's school and I would like to have you there. So we work with them to get into the, their child's school. I don't know about the parents who maybe don't feel comfortable because we only hear about the mm -hmm. parents that actually do feel comfortable and want more. If you can successfully get rid of stigma and some more young people are, feel comfortable seeking help, and I'll throw this out to the table, mm -hmm. can they find the services they need in New Mexico? A number of schools that we go into have um, well-based centers. And, uh, and we let them know that because uh, we leave them with resource cards, um, wallet cards that give them symptoms and also give them phone numbers and websites to go to. But we also um, check to see if the school has a well-based uh, wellness center so that mm -hmm. they can know that there is a place that they can immediately go to without going off campus. Dr. Davis, you worked around the state with CYFD. I'm guessing there are disparities and we're getting out to rural areas. Huge disparities. Uh, and access is a problem. It's not, sometimes there are resources available, but they're, it's difficult to access them. And the reason why is because you, you either you don't understand them or you feel a little bit the stigma. Um, but there, I would have to say that even if you say if a pediatrician or if a counselor at school uh, knew that um, a child or an adolescent was uh, significantly depressed uh, or mentally ill in some other more serious way, um, it's a difficult system to access and it's, there's huge disparities. There's more in Albuquerque, less everywhere else. Dr. Shee, is any of this changing under the Affordable Care Act, which I know is sure. facing an uncertain future? But Well, um, yes, I think it, it some important changes have happened. Um, more clinics are having behavioral health uh, uh, specialists and psychiatrists integrated into primary care. I think a lot of the stigma issues are that when people have an identified mental illness or behavioral health issue, they have to go someplace else in many communities to get care. If it's all tied into a primary care setting, 
you would go to the same place for treatment of your diabetes, you would go to the same place mm -hmm. to, to address acute care needs like a sprained ankle, and there is a behavioral health person who can help take care of you with whom you can make a relationship through the clinic. Chances are much better. I just want to emphasize mm -hmm. that. I strongly agree with that. If they're, if they're co-located, like if I can walk across the hall and I'm seeing a patient for a psychiatric illness and like I can ask Like in a ask school you, behavioral, or a school, school wellness center. Yes, yeah. the, the ease of location it makes a direct impact on how much those referrals happen and how effective they are. Um, Michelle and Maiko, what do you think would be most effective in getting young people the help they need in New Mexico? Education education, education, so that, uh, so that they feel comfortable in talking about this. I mean, stigma really is discrimination, and, and it goes across the line for adults as well as teenagers. So if teens see that their family members are not talking about this, um, then they're not going to want to talk about it. They're going to feel as isolated and ashamed as their parent might, if their parent might happen to have an illness. Uh, Mike, if we could do that, what do you think would change? Um, I feel like students, parents, um, everyone would be a lot more comfortable talking about mental health, mental illnesses, and it would definitely break the stigma surrounding that. And also, I feel like suicide rates would go down because now you you know where you can get resources or you have someone that you trust and you can go to uh, to talk about this topic. I want to thank you all for coming and talking about this. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you.